the old story has it that as we go through life, we really don't change. We just become more of the same. You look around you as the years go by and it seems a very valid premise. People don't change. As a matter of fact, most of us resist change very strongly. Yet change is a sure thing. The only variable is rate. Slow we read as evolution and fast as revolution. All of this is one way to introduce the change that occurred in my life some 30 years ago. It definitely was not more of the same. It was something I didn't worry about for a very simple reason. I didn't know it existed. There is still some discussion as to whether it was accidental or evolutionary in my case. Certainly it was revolutionary for me. Now, after many years of living with the change and exploring it, the very least I can be sure of is it didn't harm me. The most I can say is I don't know of any other facet of human existence that can produce such a broad scope of knowledge and experience. Yet it remains relatively ignored in our present cultural context. What is it? I'm sure you already know. We call it the out-of-body state. Back in 1958, when it first began to happen to me, it was called astral projection. The label felt uncomfortable to a psychologist friend and to me too. It seemed too occult, too 16th century. So we began to call it the out-of-body experience, or OBE. It fit better in the double speak of the late 20th century. No respectable researcher or scientist would be caught fooling around with astral projection, but just maybe out of body might slip through. Also, it was graphic and to the point. The out of body is a state of consciousness where you are distinct and separate from your physical body. This separateness can be two inches or 2,000 miles or more. You can think, act, and perceive in this state much as you do physically with several important exceptions. With a little practice, your five senses can be replicated while in the OB. Replication is the right description because you're not using sensory mechanisms and organs as you do physically. What you're actually using is instead something no one that I know of has taken the trouble to find out. In my own history, I began to see, first of all. I don't know how precisely I started to do that in the out-of-body state. After considerable experimentation, I learned to hear and then to feel. I've never learned how to smell or taste while in the OB state. No particular reason for this except that the need to do so never came up. Why would anyone want to go out of their body? Well, I didn't have much choice. All I wanted to do was to keep it from happening at first. Then, when I slowly learned the potentials involved, I became excited and went to work at learning how to control this activity. If all of this sounds wild, weird, or nonsense, you're just about where I was 30 years ago, and I don't blame you. If someone had told me then that I would be talking with you now about such things, I would have snorted in disgust and disbelief, and I would have recommended that he see a psychiatrist. But this is now, and some of my best friends are psychiatrists, but uh, not in a doctor-patient relationship. Today, there are over 120 consultants and associates, ranging from MDs, psychologists, college professors, physicists and scientists, to engineers and corporate executives, all actively involved in the research and educational organization we call the Monroe Institute. Each has a personal or professional interest in the out-of-body state. The Institute is internationally known for its studies in human consciousness and the use of sound wave patterns to assist changes in states of being. One of these, of course, is the out-of-body state. Recent research, not ours, has shown that 25% of our nation's population remembers having at least one spontaneous out-of-body experience. If you think about it, perhaps you'll find you're part of that 25%. The very fact that you're listening now indicates at least a casual interest or a, perhaps a search for answers. Many such out-of-bodies have been attached to the sleep state and dismissed as simply dreams, except that they didn't fit the hazy quality of dreams. They were much too vivid and real to be so classified. Other spontaneous OBs have occurred under anesthesia during surgery, where the patient found himself some six or eight feet above the operating table and later reported what he saw and heard from this vantage point. 
which would have been a physical impossibility. These are happening every day. They're unreported for the most part. Others occur during moments of unconsciousness caused by an accident or something like that. Most are relegated to an odd event and tucked away in memory as an anomaly but never happened. Our belief systems wouldn't let it be otherwise. Again, in my own case, it took a full year of spontaneous and willful out-of-body excursions with growing validation and documentations before I accepted the reality of it. The most profound of the spontaneous out-of-bodies is what is now called the near-death experience. Again, these are taking place daily, usually during surgery and under anesthesia. More and more are being reported due to the efforts and publicity by several organizations that have sprung up to investigate this phenomenon. Most near-death out-of-body experiences have the effect of changing completely the belief systems of the patient and thus their lives. They come back knowing they are more than their physical body and without any equivocation they will survive physical death. You can understand what I mean by profound if you'll think about how such knowledge, not belief or hope or faith, would affect your life, that you are indeed more than your physical body, that you do indeed survive physical death. Think about just knowing that, just those two as knowns with absolutely no conditions or complication. Human history is full of such references to what we call out of body, you're beside yourself, out of your mind, fall asleep and wake up, pass out, and it goes on and on, even to witches who rode a broomstick, myth or misconception. Every era has its own interpretation, and it's a lot of smoke to be without a fire. In our own effort over these many years, the Monroe Institute research projects have taken it the hard way. We have not used drugs or anesthesia or any other body invasive techniques, yet we have been able to induce and train subjects to achieve OBs in a constant and objective manner. It doesn't take place overnight. Some learn the process in a month, others have taken several years. Also, we have taught many spontaneous OBers to learn conscious control. We've learned much from the testing and experimentation we've done. Now we take the position that everyone moves out of their body during delta or deep sleep. The fact that you don't remember it, except possibly as dreaming, is perhaps no more than a rejection or censorship by your belief system. In the beginning of out-of-body activity, you retain the form of your physical body, head, shoulders, chest, arms, legs, and so on. If you have any internal action, such as replicated blood flow and heart, I've never been aware of it. However, again, in my own history, the more one becomes familiar with and uses this other state of being, you become less and less humanoid in form and shape. It's sort of like a gelatin taken out of a mold. For a while, it retains the shape of the mold. Then as it warms up, it becomes soft around the edges, and finally it becomes a liquid or a glob, or, say, a more convenient form, such as a teardrop, which is my favorite. Of course, you can reconstitute yourself back into your physical human shape just by thinking about it. This second body is extremely plastic. You can make it into any shape you want. You can stretch it like an incredible rubber band, release it, and it'll snap back into a central mass. So you have a tendency to fold up or melt arms and legs into the mass until you, say, need them. It's just like a jetliner does it with flaps and landing gear. You can always form new ones and do it in an instant if the need arises. However, it's important to remember that whatever the shape, you remain you. This second non-physical body seems to have little or no mass as we know it. In a completely physical environment, gravity does have a slight and perceivable effect on it. Also, there seems to be some relationship to electrical fields as it is attracted to them. On the other hand, physical matter such as chairs or a steel wall is much like a cloud you can pass through easily. And if you do so slowly enough, you can actually feel and identify the texture of the material as you go. Finally, as to where you go and what you do, there seems to be no limitation. If there is, we haven't found it. In an out-of-body state, you are no longer bound by time and space. You're not part of it. 
your normal non-physical state is another reality system. Thus you feel you're just a temporary visitor working your way through a dull gray cloud. And it's much more fun and clean to be up in the sunlight. You have a great sense of freedom, yet you're not. You're like a balloon or a kite on a tether. At the other end of the cord is your physical body. How do you learn to go out of your body? At this point, I cannot tell you of a quick, instant way to willfully achieve the out-of-body state. Uh, well, I can, but they're too permanent. I'm sure you can too, such as driving your car over a thousand-foot cliff. But you're not ready for that, I'm sure. However, there are methods and techniques to slowly and carefully learn the out-of-body process and how to control it. I'm sure those we've developed, but a few of many, we do know it takes time and effort, a commitment on the part of the individual just as rigid and consistent as that required by any other major human endeavor. The greatest problem lies in the adjustment in your personal belief system and your fear barrier. Getting past these is no easy matter. Perhaps it will help if I get a little bit more personal. Perhaps you can understand a little better. Back in 1958, without any seeming cause, I began to float out of my physical body. It was not during sleep, so I couldn't label it as simply a dream. I had full conscious awareness of what was happening, which of course only made it worse. That meant to me some form of severe hallucination caused by something dangerous, a brain tumor or a stroke, or some mental illness. At the time, I was in reasonably good health, had no major problems or stress, just an ordinary guy doing ordinary things. I owned several radio stations, had offices on Madison Avenue in New York, home in Westchester County, and not the least, a wife and two small children. I was taking no medication, used no drugs, and drank very little alcohol. I was not particularly involved in any religious activity, nor was I a deep student of philosophies and Eastern disciplines. The point of all this is to show how completely unprepared I was for such a radical change. Perhaps the best way to convey what is meant by the out-of-body experience is to describe that first time it happened to me. For some weeks I had encountered a strange sense of vibration, which I felt when I lay down for a nap or for a night's sleep. It didn't take place every time, but often enough to give me concern. When I felt the vibration begin, my body became paralyzed and I couldn't move and it took tremendous effort to sit up. And when I did, the vibrations faded away. I went to my doctor about it and after an examination, he couldn't find any reason for it. And he sent me home with some pills to help me relax more. Like most of us, I didn't take them regularly. I either forgot about it or they made me too dopey or sleepy. Finally, I stopped fighting the sensation, saying to myself, if it's going to kill me, let it happen, let's get it over with. So the next time when I lay down and the vibration surged into me, I just lay there and waited for something to happen. The sensation simply faded away after about five minutes. After that, I simply waited for the vibrations to get through their cycle. Then I would go to sleep. I stopped worrying about it. They were like hiccups. You don't concentrate on them and they go away. Then on a Friday night, I went to bed early so I would be fresh on a Saturday. I was to leave early in the morning to go over to a place called Wurzboro in New York, to fly gliders or to be more exact, sailplanes. A cold front had come through, which meant there would be strong northwest winds and a clear day, and that meant good soaring on thermals. When I got into bed and settled down, the vibrations came and I began to wait them out so I could go to sleep. As I was lying there, I thought how nice it was going to be the next day, soaring, soaring, and how good it would feel when a strong thermal lifted you upward smoothly and easily. And I just lay there thinking about all these wonderful gliding prospects. After a few moments of such contemplation, I felt a bump against my shoulder. And I turned and looked and I found my shoulder bouncing against the floor. My first thought was that I had fallen asleep and rolled out of bed. Then I suddenly realized that it couldn't be the floor because there was a rug on the bedroom floor. Also, not far from me was what looked to be a fountain sticking up out of the floor. This was certainly a strange dream, I thought. And then I noticed that there was something familiar about the fountain. It wasn't a fountain. It was a light fixture a chandelier, and if it was a chandelier, I was upside down. 
and if I rolled over, I might see what this was all about. And so I did, and sure enough, there was our bed down below me, and there was my wife lying in bed asleep, and there was someone in the bed with her, also asleep. I remember wondering with amusement, whom would I dream to be in bed with my wife? And then I focused on the man's head, and that's when the shock hit me. It was my face. I was in bed with my wife. And what was I doing up against the ceiling? I was absolutely sure of the answer. I was dying. This is what it was to die, and I didn't want to die. I panicked. And in frantic terror, I swam and clawed my way through the air back to the bed and my body, and somehow snapped back inside. I sat up in bed and in the dim light looked up at the ceiling and the chandelier and slowly calmed down as best I could. The vibrations didn't come back for the rest of the night and nor did any sleep. In the morning I didn't go gliding, I did what I'm sure you would have done. I made my doctor friend see me on an emergency basis. He immediately recognized the seriousness of my anxiety and even recommended hospitalization. But he couldn't find anything physically wrong with me, so he gave me some more pills, and I went home. This time, I took the pills. After several more times floating over the bed, totally uncontrolled, pills or no pills, I went back to my doctor for help. I was deeply worried or deeply frightened. I was so sure of two things. One, that I wasn't the psychotic type. And two, that our body of science, including medicine, had the answers for everything. Maybe not the cure, but at least a good, solid opinion. It had to be something physical that was causing the hallucination, like a brain tumor. My doctor friend saw immediately the depth of my fear and put me through a complete and extensive exam, the whole thing. Blood tests, fluoroscopes, x-rays, the works. The results were negative, much to his surprise and, well, same surprise to me. He finally sent me home with another set of pills and to call him if the thing persisted. As for me, I was tremendously disappointed. I was sure there would be a reasonable answer or a good opinion based on previous scientific research or studies, but there was none. No recognized and acceptable authority on the subject. The only recommendation I received was five to 10 years of psychotherapy. More, those I talked to were not even particularly curious, polite, but that's about all. Western civilization, in which I was an active participant and believer, had let me down. It was a very lonely moment. After about the tenth OB experience, without any effects other than my own terror and fright, I suddenly realized the obvious. It wasn't going to kill me. The thing itself actually was not going to kill me. And whatever else, I just might not be hallucinating, because, like the chandelier from the ceiling perspective, I was getting small bits of verification that were useful only to me. From that moment on, I stopped being afraid of going out of the body. That's not to say I didn't later encounter some very fearsome situations. I did. But after that, it was a simple need to get the thing under control, to somehow first learn to stop it when I wanted to, and then to learn how to start it if I felt like it. I began taking careful notes, attempting to be as objective as I possibly could. The record keeping might help me review what was happening. Also to gather information and help in some form of testing, we set up a research and development division in a corporation privately owned by me and my family. This eventually became the Monroe Institute. So that there can be no misconception, all of this organized effort and expenditure was not aimed at the betterment of humankind. It was not set up to prove to the scientific community and the world large that there truly was such a phenomenon as the out-of-body experience. Thus, no academic papers of our work appeared in any scientific journals. Orthodox scientific methods were followed whenever feasible, but not in an orderly manner. Until 1971, the whole process operated very quietly, if not exactly covertly. After all, I was the head of a very conventional business and dealing with conventional people. I was sure any public revelation of my secret life activity would bring an adverse effect on my ability to conduct such businesses. In retrospect, I still believed it was good reasoning. Thus, the original purpose was solely to solve my own personal and urgent needs, to learn how to control and understand what was happening to me. 
I was the one who needed help. So the motive to learn and investigate was personal and selfish, not profound or idealistic or noble. I offer no apology for this simply because I was the one who was paying the bills. I will admit to one thing. Once the fear was gone, it was replaced by something equally demanding. I got curious and a little less lonely. The adventures of those early days and the incidents and activities that took place back then appear in detail in my book, Journeys Out of the Body, which was first published in 1971 by Doubleday and is still in print in the bookstores. I think that perhaps I ought to acquaint you with our position as to reporting of my out-of-body activities and other events, as well as our related research. We attempt to tell it like it is. We try to strip away any myths, religious beliefs, conventional ethics, morality, and other factors that might distort the picture. We try to begin with a clean slate, as it were. By doing so, we hope to uncover new views on old ideas that make sense to the late 20th century Western mind. Above all, we don't place value judgments on any event or information. So far, it seems to work, sometimes not easily because physical imprints die hard. An early item of interest might be one of the first major evidential trips I made and a peculiar part that almost went unnoticed. A psychologist friend, Foster Bradshaw, who lived several miles away, began to work with us as a consultant, and we had a standing agreement that whenever I felt like it, I should try to reach him during an out-of-body state. One weekend, I called to find Brad sick in bed with a cold, and after hanging up the phone, I decided it would be an ideal time to try it. I knew where he was, and I knew the direction of his house, so he should be an easy target. That afternoon, I finally was able to roll out of my body, then lift up through the roof of my one-room cabin office and head over the treetops to Brad's house. I finally got there, and I went through the wall into his bedroom, and to my surprise, he wasn't in bed, and nor was he in the bathroom. I went back outside, out through the wall, to be sure I had the right room. When I went out behind the house, I saw his wife coming out the back door, followed by Brad, and then they headed for the garage. I tried to get his wife's attention without success, and then I turned to Brad and tried to get his attention, and after much gyrating in the air in front of him as he walked, he responded with, well, I see you made it. Greatly satisfied and excited, I returned back to the body and wrote down what I had seen and heard and the real clock time. Checking in that night with Brad, he told me that he indeed was not in his bed at that time. He had gotten bored and had decided to go with his wife to the post office. They were walking across the back lawn at exactly the time I had indicated. My description of their clothing matched perfectly, but Brad did not remember talking with me. The strange part of the event on my way to visit Brad in the out-of-body state, I suddenly felt I didn't have enough energy to make it and began to sag downward into the trees. At that moment, someone helped me. I felt a hand under each elbow lifting me up in the direction of Brad's house. When I got there, the hands released me and left. Who were these helpers? I still am not sure. Another incident comes to mind from back in the early days. Just as I was getting comfortable with the technique I had learned to induce the out-of-body state, an interesting lesson came about. I guess that's what you would call it. It was afternoon and I lay down in the cot in my cabin office and started to use this separation process. I just was able to roll out of the physical when I felt someone grabbing me from behind and I could feel this strange body plastered against my back and a head poked over my shoulder and the lips and the head were next to my ear and there was a loud and deep panting right in my ear i could hear it very loudly i immediately reacted some monster was trying to take over and get into my body i turned and slipped back into the physical as fast as i could i sat up and looked around there was nothing unusual everything was the same and no sign of the monster I tried the technique a second time, and as soon as I started to move out of the body, there was the monster again, holding onto my back and panting in my ear. 
I quickly moved back into the physical and called it a day. The next morning, after three more attempts to get out of body by this method and still finding the monster on my back, I got angry. Who is this character that thinks he can interfere in my life? So when I rolled out of my body again, and there it was, on my back, groaning, head over my shoulder, I reached back and tried to pull it off. My hand touched the face, and then the chin and the cheek, and they had whiskers. Whiskers, that meant a male, and I didn't like the idea of a male hanging on to me like that. I slipped back in the body and tried to figure out how to get rid of it. As I sat there, breathing heavily from the excitement, I happened to rub my hand across my physical chin. Then it all flicked into place. I heard myself panting and rubbed the whiskers on my chin, sitting there in my physical body. And then I laughed. That's real paranoia, afraid of my own physical body. I checked it out. When I altered the breathing pattern of my physical body just at the point of separation, so did my monster. And finally, to prove the point, I went up into the bathroom, took a very clean shave, then came back, lay down, rolled out of my body slowly and checked. My monster's chin was smooth, and it faded away as I moved further from my physical. So much for my dangerous monster. In those early turbulent days, we finally moved to set up some kind of program that would develop conscious control of the out-of-body process. If no one really knew anything about it from a causative aspect, we would take the route of investigating what we had first, namely me, and go on from there. We, meaning a friendly psychologist, a curious physicist, and an indifferent electronics engineer, we put together a modest research facility on the land back of my house in Westchester County. There was some 30 acres in which to hide it, so the distant neighbors never knew it was there. As my career had been in sound, the production of network radio programs and music principally, we started with this base, and it was in this lab back in the woods of Westchester that we first began to use sound to affect brainwave patterns in a human, and thus his mental and emotional behavior. We learned that we could help people go to sleep and stay awake, for example. We focused upon the sleep area because the out-of-body state seemed somehow related. We learned what frequencies help to produce specific states of consciousness, and the very many that don't seem to do anything. We called the pattern a Frequency Following Response, or FFR. And what we do today, both in education and research in our laboratory, is an evolving and sophisticated extrapolation of what began way back then. The fallout from our main effort brought such applications as a drugless means to go into and control sleep, keeping awake, intense focus of attention, accelerated learning of both mental and motor skills, self-acquisition of various levels of individual consciousness, stress tension reduction, and pain control, to name a few. We call the process hemisync, or Hemispheric synchronization, which is a description of the coherent EEG brain pattern evoked by the method. So, after some 30 years of dealing with the out-of-body experiences, here are a few no's I can pass along. First, the out-of-body is not going to kill you, just as I like to report. In and of itself, it cannot be classified as dangerous to your physical health. Mentally and emotionally, no problem if you take it one step at a time. Most of my medical friends agree that I'm still operational physically simply because of my OB activities, not in spite of it. Second, such experiences do not lead to withdrawal of interest in physical life. It's not necessary to go live in a cave. Rather, the different overview you develop enhances all that you do and think in this here and now. You won't get rich in the conventional sense as a result, although there's nothing to stop you from doing so. As to other kinds of wealth, that's something else. I'm sure you now have an idea about such matters. At the very, very least, I now know and understand myself. Add to that a broad-banded participation in human life activity during the 20th century, the age of the fire wagons. Great stuff. Well, see you in 12, we're on the high road. And thank you for listening.